The year is 2004. It's E3 time, and Nintendo fans are excited about the brand new DS being introduced. But during this presentation, Iwata subverts everybody's expectations when he shifts into talking about a new home console that he said would offer an unprecedented play experience, something no other machine had delivered before. He announces the new project under the codename Revolution. Two years pass, and E3 2006 arrives with a full press conference showing off the brand new console, now named the Wii, an all new console with revolutionary motion controls. Hype for the console grows as huge release titles such as The Legend of Zelda, Twilight Princess, and Wii Sports are announced. The launch finally happens, and it goes down as one of the most successful in Nintendo's history, with 600,000 consoles sold in the first 8 days after its launch in the United States. Over time, many franchises were brought over to the Wii from the DS, such as Mario Party, Donkey Kong, Mario Kart, Guitar Hero, Animal Crossing, and so many more. But even among all of these franchises, fans were still looking for one beloved title from the handheld era. New Super Mario Brothers. It wouldn't be long until fans of the series would get what they had been asking for. At E3 2009, Nintendo revealed New Super Mario Brothers Wii, taking the series to the next level with all new worlds, secrets, levels, and for the first time, four player simultaneous multiplayer. On November 15th, 2009, the game was released in the US, four days after its initial release in Australia. People started playing on day one and began to post about the contents of the game. The obvious observation was that the game consisted of eight worlds, all with different themes such as grassland, desert, forest, and more. To clear each world, you don't have to beat every single level, as there are some split paths, but you must beat the castle at the end of each world to progress to the next world. That requirement is, however, skippable. Like the previous installment, the game has many secret exits that can lead to cannons that shoot you off to other worlds, but we'll get back to those. Upon beating Bowser in World 8's castle, also referred to as 8 Castle, the game is considered beaten. However, a ninth world is unlocked at this point. The levels work a little differently in this world, though. Each level is unlocked by getting all star coins in its respective world. For example, level 1 is unlocked upon collecting every star coin in world 1, level 2 is unlocked upon collecting all star coins in world 2, and so on, all the way up to level 8. But this is irrelevant to any percent. Why? Well, any percent in New Super Mario Bros. Wii means getting to world 8's castle and defeating Bowser to beat the game as fast as possible without the use of cheats, and it certainly does not include beating world 9. How did the community optimize the game to its current state? How were new strategies discovered? And more importantly, where does the world record stand today? Can it ever be beaten? Let's find out, as we unravel the world record history of New Super Mario Bros. Wii. At 11.42am on the US release date of NSMBW, a Speed Demos archive thread was created. Users immediately started speculation on how to beat the game as fast as possible, just like any other popular video game. A day and a half after the thread was created, a user that goes by the name of Spikey said that the fastest way to beat the game seemed to be by taking the cannon in World 1 from the secret exit in level 1-3 to travel to World 5, the cannon in World 5 from the secret exit in the ghost house to travel to World 8, and taking the secret exit in level 8-2 to skip to level 8-7, and completing the game from there. Speculation also began on whether 5-2 or 5-3 was faster, but it would remain unknown for the time being. For a few days, no single segment runs of the game were completed. The thread was mainly individual level, or IL, optimizations, and focused on other things, like routing 100%. Runner UC Pro would make lots of optimizations to ILs and create strategies that would be used for future single segment runs. It wouldn't be until November 22nd that Runner MWL would claim to have beaten the game in about 45 minutes. Nothing is known about the run other than that he claims to have died three times and that he believed that beating the game in any time under 30 minutes was unrealistic. This initial hype would die down, and from late 2009 to early 2011, no any percent runs were completed. It wasn't until May 29, 2011 that the first known, recorded, single segment any percent speedrun of NSMBW was uploaded. The run was completed by a runner that goes by the name of Raker Z, and he would finish the run with a time of 27.08, almost 3 minutes faster than what MWL thought was possible. The reason this run was possible was because of the 2 year period that SDA members spent optimizing the game's individual levels. This run was a combination of all of those strategies and movement optimizations put into one single run. It's worthy to note that Raker Z timed this run using his personal timing method, which started at the beginning of the cutscene that panned over World 1. Modern day timing starts as soon as you get control of Mario on the first input, so his timing method loses him about 12 seconds. This means his 2708 was actually a 2656, making it the first ever sub-27. It's interesting to note that if you were to look up the video, you would notice something out of the ordinary. The video has a lot of dislikes. Why? because people believe the run was spliced. This was due to the fact that Raker Z recorded his runs on a DVD recorder, so his runs would come out choppy due to a less than ideal method of recording. 
Today, we know this run is legitimate because he would go on to beat this time with better recordings, and it wouldn't make any logical sense to splice one run that you could beat anyways, and the video didn't show any other signs that generally signify that someone is splicing a run together. The run didn't have any huge mistakes in it, however it was not extremely optimized and was overall pretty sloppy. One noteworthy aspect of this run is the strategy used in level 5-4, one of the first real strategies developed for the category that had the player beating a level in an unintended way. This trick is known as 5-4 skip, and has existed for years before this run was completed. In this level, the developers intended Mario to ride a raft along a poison lake that stopped when five entities were on it, including coins. This was obviously very slow, and runners quickly found a way around it. It is unknown exactly when this trick was discovered, but UC Pro, the runner mentioned earlier, presumably created the strategy and posted about it on November 29th, 2009, so this strategy was found very early, whether or not this was the first post about it or not. This early method avoided wall jumping, presumably because of its inconsistency and just propeller to the next platform available in order to avoid the poison. The modern version of this trick involves wall jumping at a specific point and a specific strength in order to avoid hitting the enemies above. While it is more risky, it's much faster, and you won't have to wait for enemies to move out of the way so that you could land on the platform. In addition, having 5-4 skip in the run means that the propeller must be kept until 5-4, meaning you would have to be much more careful than MWL would have had to be. This run was very important, as we would finally get a good look at what a solid single segment run of this game would look like, and a basic route would be established too. For example, getting the propeller in 1-1, damage boosting in 8-1, and getting the propeller back in 8 airship are still done to this day and were introduced in this run. This run would stand for an entire 7 months until December 30th, 2011, when Raker Z would clock in a run with a time of 26-01. With modern timing, that comes down to a 25-49, a full minute down from his last time, and the first ever sub-26. No new major strategies were found within this time, so how did he cut his time down by such a substantial amount? The answer is consistency. Raker Z was getting much better at each individual level, and putting all of that practice together was how he lowered his time by a whole minute. The only noticeable change in this run from the last was that he opted to get a mushroom in 8-7 rather than 8-2 after damage boosting in 8-1, which is what is done today, except he used the checkpoint flag, and runners today get a mushroom from an item block. This is because the flagpole is slightly slower as a result of the animation of the flag changing from Bowser to Mario. The one notable mistake in this run is an accidental spin in the Ghost House of World 5, but aside from that, the rest of the run only had minor inconsistencies overall. The record stood for a few months until Raker Z would beat his own record once again with a time of 2531 on March 26th, 2012, which would be his first run timed with the modern timing method. This run was better overall than the last one, with more consistent movement and fewer mistakes throughout. Despite a shaky 5-2 in World 8 Castle, everything else was solid. It would not be until October of that year that he would once again break his own record on the 11th with a time of 25-28, finally breaking the sub-25-30 barrier. This run was important due to the fact that it was the first completed any percent run to do 5-3 instead of 5-2 at the split path of World 5. It had been theorized previously that 5-3 was a faster level, but it was never extensively tested, and the level was too risky for a single segment run anyway, so runners decided to do 5-2. However, after a bit of testing, Raker Z discovered that it was about 3 seconds faster to do 5-3. This was the only major difference between this run and the last. He stated that he could save about 10 seconds in World 8's castle, but we would never see him save those 10 seconds, as this is the last world record we would ever see from him. After Raker Z's sudden departure from NSMBW, the community would stay silent for nearly three years. Very little activity happened during this time, but one thing was always on people's minds, defeating Raker Z. It would not be easy, but it could be done, and this is what would bring new runners into the game after years of inactivity. However, we wouldn't see any of these new runners until late 2015. Who would be the first person to be able to play at the level of Raker Z? It would be a runner that goes by the name of Green Operator. Green Operator started speedrunning NSMBW in October of 2015, and also dabbled in other games like Super Paper Mario. He would play the game for hours a day, practicing and improving, and eventually that dedication would pay off when he would complete a run with a time of 2526 on March 5th, 2016. Unfortunately, no footage of this run exists, and as a result, it was never put on any leaderboards. However, the community accepted this time as legitimate, as he had good times before it, and he would eventually go on to beat this time. So, while this was a world record, it was never officially classified as such, but it still holds a legendary status in the community, as it was the first time Raker Z's record had been beaten. A few months before this run, around early 2016, another runner that goes by the name Ochgard would also be learning how to speedrun NSMBW. He got interested in the game because at the time, Raker Z's run had still not been beaten for three years. After Green Operator had already gotten his 25-26, Ochgard would get a time of 25-28, tying Raker Z's world record. 
This would show that he was not only on Rekuzi's level, but that he was also close to Green Uprooty's level. It would only be a matter of time until he beat them. And that time finally came, on April 25th, 2016, when Ochgard would get a 25-23. This record was streamed live, and the world record was official. However, the VOD was unfortunately lost, and can no longer be found on the internet. This record was a huge deal, as it was the first time Rekuzi had been verifiably beaten. While there is no recording available, Ochgard did provide information on the run. According to him, the run was worse overall than his tied world record of 25-28. However, he had a better World 8 castle, which saved him a few seconds over Green's run. This was the first time there was serious competition for the world record in NSMBW's history, and this competition would inspire many of today's players to start running the game. However, the fierce competition would be short-lived. On April 26, the day after the previous run, Ochgard got a 25-22, shaving one second off his previous run. This run had a slappier beginning than the last run, and although World 8 started off messy, he picked it up at the end in 8 airship and 8 castle, which would give him the edge over his previous run. After PBing two days in a row, Ochgard would make that three days in a row. On the next day, April 17th, he would get a 25-19, improving his last run by three seconds. This was a very solid run for the time. While he had a worse early game than the last run, he had a better mid to late game. However, opposite to his last run, 8 airship and 8 castle were a bit sloppy. There were definitely time saves throughout the run, especially towards the beginning, but there were no huge mistakes that would leave multiple seconds of time save anymore. From here on out, the game would be a battle for seconds. It would take Ochgard 4 months of practice and runs to PB again on August 9th with a time of 25-14. This run had the least mistakes out of any of his runs, which is what allowed him to shave 5 seconds off the last run. This was the record that made the community start to seriously ask themselves if sub-25 was possible. Some thought it was, some thought it wasn't, but one thing was for sure. It would take a run with absolutely no mistakes to pull off unless a strategy was found that could save more than milliseconds at a time. The world record would once again be improved on August 16th, about a week after his last PB, with a time of 25-12.8. This run had a notably messy 5-3, but the last three levels ultimately saved the run. The next day, Ochgard would drop his time by a tenth of a second, bringing it down to 25-12.7. This run's slappy level happened to be 8-2, but consistency through the rest of the run kept it alive. The day after that, August 18th, Och would drop his time down to 25-12.1 and also have another 3 day streak of world records. He saved the time he needed to after the sloppy 8-2 from the last run, and that allowed him to PB once more. As the sub-25 barrier seemed more and more in reach, the community was growing strong, with more runners active than ever before. Sub-25 seemed even more realistic after Och would get a 25-10 on September 4th, 2016. This run was close to even with his last PB until 8 Castle, which he would gold. The next day, Och would get a 2509. The beginning of this run was average for him, but a gold on levels 8-1 and 8-2 would lead to him getting the first ever 25-0x. A month would pass until he got his next, very important PB on October 2nd, when he would get a 2506. What makes this run so important? A little thing called 556. Oh my god. Did you get it? Yep. You did? Yes. Oh my god. Today, World 5's Fortress is infamous for top NSMBW speedrunners because of 556. You see, World 5's Fortress is cycle-based, which essentially means that even if you go fast or slow, as long as you're within a certain time frame, you'll always end with the same in-game time, because the walls that move back and forth with spikes on them would block your path if you went too fast. For a long time, the optimal in-game time to enter the door to the Iggy fight was 546. It was known that 556 was possible, as task runs had been opting to use that cycle, but it was barely possible for a human to do at this point. However, Ochgard proved that it was possible to do in a single segment run, as he did it for the first time in this 25 minute and 6 second speedrun. This insanely difficult cycle was one of the first time saves found that actually saved a significant amount of time, about 7.5 seconds. While this cycle wasn't extremely viable just yet, it was certainly a step in the right direction for the journey to sub-25. Other than being the first run to have 556 in it, the run was solid overall. It had no major mistakes, just some rough edges here and there, especially World 8. On the next day, October 3rd, Och would finish a run with a time of 25.04. This run would go down as a meme in the community because he lost time in the two spots you don't normally lose time at, the Piranha in World 5 and Level 8-7. Generally, time isn't lost in the Piranha because it's an easier part of the run where you just need to jump at the right times. The average in-game time to end Piranhas with is a 93, however he ended with a 90. 
The three seconds he lost in 8-7 is also unorthodox, because 8-7 is an auto-scroller, and there aren't many opportunities to lose time. Despite these odd mistakes, the run was very solid overall, and in the end, he managed to beat his PB. This record would stand for an entire two months. The community gathered to his streams over these months, waiting for the inevitable sub-25. Even with 5-5-6, it was still going to be no easy feat. He would have to play extremely well and make little to no mistakes to shave off five seconds. And on November 23rd, 2016, he would do just that. On this legendary day in the game's history, Oshgard would complete New Super Mario Bros. Wii in 24 minutes and 58 seconds, the first ever sub-25. This run started off as any other run would, but the run began to show promise as he got into World 5. He managed to get the 5-5-6 cycle and save time in 8-7, at which point he would be 5 seconds ahead of his old PB. He would continue to perform at this high level and clutch out the world record. Oshgard and the community were astounded by the amazing level of performance in this run. It was the god run, and everybody agreed that it was nearly untouchable. The chances of anyone successfully performing 556 and making almost zero mistakes again was highly unlikely, and even Oshgard agreed. He would put down the category for a while and move on to Canonless in 100%. The run would stand for 15 months, but the community was still hard at work during this time, optimizing the game and figuring new things out. During this time, on January 8th, 2018, a new strat was discovered by Green Operator that would change the way New Super Mario Bros. Wii would be run forever. So, what exactly is happening here? It's a little complicated, so I'll do my best to explain. It all started one day when I Love SMB was playing around with the game, and discovered that it's possible to defeat Bowser Jr. in World 6 Airship by jumping on top of his head, rather than using the bumper car the game intends you to use, and this was proven to be much faster. After receiving this knowledge, Green started to question whether or not you could do the same thing during the Bowser Jr. fight in 8 Airship. The only problem with the theory was that Bowser Jr. was too close to the ceiling, creating a very small gap, and Mario's hitbox was larger than that gap. However, after many hours of attempting the trick, Green managed to fit in the space between Bowser Jr. and the ceiling by performing a ground pound within a 1-2 frame window. What makes this possible is the mechanics of ground pounding and Bowser Jr.'s clown car oscillations up and down. In this game, ground pounding decreases the vertical height of Mario's hitbox, so the runner must perform a ground pound. It's possible to perform a ground pound at this point because running into the clown car will cancel Mario's floating state, the time spent falling after propellering shown here. That's not all though. The ground pound can only interact with Bowser Jr.'s hitbox when the clown car is on a downwards oscillation. If you look carefully at this clip, you'll notice that Bowser Jr.'s path left and right is not linear, it also moves slightly up and down. A ground pound will deal damage to Bowser Jr. while his clown car is at its lowest point, with only a few frame window. So now the game finally has another time save, right? It just needs to be made consistent like 5.56's. Well, not exactly. The trick is really hard. Like, really, really hard. In fact, the first hit is extremely difficult, as the window to jump and the window to propeller is not that large. And sure, you could try to go at it from a different spot, but now you're dealing with luck, and a completely different situation every single time. It's best to boil it all down to skill and use a semi-consistent setup. As a result of having a small window, the audio and visual cues that runners use cannot guarantee the trick will work consistently, so it all comes down to muscle memory. This wasn't the case at the time of the trick's discovery, though. People were making the trick out to be luck, as there was no one way of doing it at the time. People were literally approaching the trick from multiple different ways, and it led to the conclusion that the trick was pure luck, but over time, that changed. And today, it's viewed as a trick of extreme precision. Testing of this trick found that Bombless would save up to 13 seconds. Another thing that was theoretically possible, but highly unlikely to happen, was Double Bombless. This trick is exactly what it sounds like, it's Bombless, but done twice. At the time though, people weren't even thinking about attempting this trick. Single Bombless, as I will be referring to it from now on, was already difficult enough, and saved plenty of time for runners to be content for now. If Double Bombless did happen though, it would save between 18 and 20 seconds. It's worthy to note that Triple Bombless is possible, but it was quickly proven to be slower, because you can use a bomb to hit Bowser Jr. on the first or second hit, which is faster than flying all the way up to Bowser Jr., and more consistent as you don't have to hope for a properly timed ground pound. 
What made this trick even more difficult was practicing it, as no practice ROMs of the game existed at the time. In order to practice the trick, the runner would have to make his or her way to World 8 in the navigation menu, go to 8 airship, play through the whole entire level, and if they failed the trick, which chances are they did, they would have to play through the entire second half of the level from the checkpoint again. This discouraged many runners from practicing the trick for hours at a time, as it would get extremely repetitive and boring to run through the level. Despite this, it wouldn't be long until runners started to attempt bombless in their runs, as attempting the trick generally didn't lose time. The first bombless hit in a single segment run was successfully performed by a runner that goes by the name of Gixa1 on March 25th, 2018. While he did perform the trick, he lost the run due to nerves in 8 Castle. Notice how much his cursor shakes after resetting. It's worthy to note that this run was on world record pace, and could have easily beat Ochgar, as Bombless didn't exist when he started running the game. On March 28th, 2018, Chaos Carl would perform Bombless in a cannonless race. No, I just need to get Bombless and, and I got Bombless! What the fuck? I... I... Yo, yo, that's... What the fuck? I just... <laughs> Since Gixa1 died and reset, this was the first time Bombless was performed in a completed run. But like I said before, runners still weren't seriously attempting this trick at the time, and it was still viewed as all luck. Fade Vanity was an unknown speedrunner just starting to get his footing in the NSMBW community in late 2017. This would be his first ever speed game, and he would take it very seriously. Fade would grind for many hours a day when he first started, and as a result of this grind, his first run was a 25-24, which was and still is extremely impressive for a first run. In this PB, he opted to do 5-2 instead of 5-3, as it was much easier, and the time save was not necessary for a mid-25. 5-5-6 was also not attempted, as it is extremely difficult and only performed at a very high level. Over the next few weeks, he would continue to grind and drop his time down to a 25-02 on March 3rd, 2018, putting him 5 seconds away from beating the world record. The community would tune into his streams, waiting for the moment that Ochgard wouldn't have the world record anymore for the first time in years. On April 13th, 2018, that moment would finally come. I DID IT! I did it! I did it! I did it, I did it, I did it, oh my fucking god, I did it. Ochgard's reign would finally be ended by Fade. It wasn't anywhere close to easy, but he managed to do it. However, saying it was ended was an understatement. It was obliterated. Fade got a 24-45, a run 13 seconds faster than the previous world record, and the run did not get a 5-5-6 cycle. So, how is it possible that he beat Ochgard's time by so much? Well, the answer isn't single bombless. That only saves around 7 seconds. The answer is actually double bombless, which saves about 20 seconds on average. This feat is more impressive than you think though. While single bombless had been performed multiple times before this run, double bombless had not. And it was not just the first time it had been performed in a single segment run, it was actually the first time it had ever been performed by a human, making this an indescribable moment for Fade and the community as a whole, showing that it was possible to pull off. This run was amazing, but as I stated before, it had one glaring flaw, the lack of 556. This meant that the world record didn't have 556. However, this record did have double bombless. Even 556 and single bombless would not be enough to beat it without perfect gameplay. So this would mean that Fade or anybody else would have to do double bombless again in order to beat his time, and it had only ever been performed by a human once. Calling this difficult would be an unbelievable understatement. After months of attempts and grinding and many runs failing to 8 airship, Fade would finally clutch out another world record run with a time of 24.40 on September 2nd, 2018. This run was nearly flawless, but had the same issue as the last record, a lack of 556. Fade was able to pull off double bombless again, but he was still not able to pull off 556, meaning that there was still a significant amount of time to be saved, about 7 seconds. 24-3x was now extremely realistic, and more than likely, inevitable. After getting this world record, while playing around with 556, Fade found a new way to make the cycle that would make it slightly easier than before, but don't be fooled, because the trick was still incredibly difficult. 
The new method involved wall kicking off this wall near the top of the stage, making it significantly easier to propel her off of the following platforms. In addition to an easier 556 method, a different, faster way of doing double bombas was found, appropriately named Coding Bombas after the person who created it, the Coding Boy. It involves getting a bombless hit on Bowser Jr. instantly on the first cycle, then immediately again on the second cycle. The difference between this and normal double bombless is that normal double bombless was done by doing bombless on the first cycle and the third cycle, or the second cycle and the third cycle. By doing bombless exclusively on the first and second cycle, you can hit Bowser Jr. with the bomb that Bowser Jr. drops as soon as the fight begins. This saves about 2-3 to three seconds compared to a normal double bombless, and as a result, runners opted to do this method from now on, although it was more risky, as failing would lose you time. As I mentioned earlier, failing bombless previously generally didn't lose any time, which is why you would see runners attempt the trick in their runs often. With these new strats at his disposal, Fade began grinding any percent after a short break, and after 5 months of grinding, Fade would finally reach his biggest goal yet. Let's go, let's go, let's go, we fucking did it, let's go, 3x, come on, let's go, <laughs> let's fucking did it, 3x, there you go, and that is why this category is mine. The final time of this run is 2434, and it was completed on March 9th, 2019. This run included every major optimization currently in the game. It had 556, which he completed so fast that his time going into the door was actually 557, and it had bombless. With all of this time saved, Fade was able to close out the first ever 24-3x and celebrate his victory. He had truly dominated the category, and no one was near him. Any percent was his. This wouldn't be the end of his any percent domination, though. About a month later, Fade would have his first run on 24-2x pace. The run was looking promising, as he would be ahead of his previous time all the way up until 8 airship. Then, this happened. Okay, is this pace? Is this pace? Is this on pace? Oh shit, oh shit. Okay, okay, alright, alright. You motherfucker. Oh my god, dude. Alright, well, we can clutch out a few so I'll just keep going. Fade missed the hit on the second cycle of Bowser Jr., meaning he failed coding bombless, but he did pull off regular double bombless, making him lose a couple seconds. However, Fade was still able to pull off a world record for two reasons. The first reason is that the 8 castle in his previous world record wasn't perfect, and he was able to improve on that. The second reason was a new way of ending escape, which is what the community calls the section where Bowser chases after Mario and shoots fireballs at him. Here's the new ending, called Tommy Strat. Unlike what I said before, Tommy Strat was actually not really a new way of ending escape. It was done by none other than Ochgard, as you'll see here in this clip. He did this in many of his world records, but stopped doing it when he got 25-12.1. Why would he stop? Probably because of the high risk. Because this trick is at the very end of the run, it's easy to get nervous and mess up this trick, and making one wrong move can lead to your death, as Mario barely reaches the platform. After abandoning this way of ending the run, it was quickly forgotten about by the community. That was until runner TommyGun75 accidentally rediscovered the trick. During one of his old PVs of 2645, he messed up his movement in escape and did the strat because he was positioned differently than normal. Fade was in his chat at the time, and noticed that the trick might be faster than what runners had been doing. Other runners also agreed that it could have been faster. After doing some testing and timing, it turned out that this trick saved about 0.5 seconds compared to a normal escape ending. And so, the trick was named Tommy Strat, and very high level runners would start practicing it and implementing it in their runs. The way Fade did this trick was slightly different though. Rather than just propellering up to the platform, he propelled to the side of the wall and wall jumped onto the platform, similar to what's done in 5-4 skip. This saved him a small amount of time over the conventional method of performing it. So, with a better 8 castle overall and the implementation of Tommy Strat, Fade was able to beat his previous record by 2 seconds, finishing with a time of 24-32 on April 20th, 2019. This run showed Fade and the community that 24-2x was definitely possible, it would just take a near perfect run. Fade would have to put weeks, maybe even months, into grinding the game in order to pull off a run good enough to get a 24-2x. Or at least, that's what we thought.
Come on, man. Come on, give me a coding double, please. Oh shit, let's go. Let's go. Oh fuck. All right. Let's go. Oh shit. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Oh my god, dude. <laughs> We fucking got it, dude. <laughs> we fucking got it, dude. On the very next day, April 21st, Fade would finally reach his ultimate goal of a 24-2x with a final time of 24-29. This is probably one of the best overall runs of this game to date. Everything was exactly how Fade wanted. There were no notable mistakes throughout the run, and the only things that could have been better with the strats he went for were Goomba RNG in World 1 to save about a half a second and going for more difficult movement in 8 Airship and 8 Castle. Let's actually halt for a second and go into way too much detail about the Goomba RNG I mentioned before. What we knew about this at the time was that it was possible to lose time on the splits 1-2, 1-3, and 1 cannon due to the Goomba that appears off screen in World 1, but we didn't know exactly why. Now we do. This might get a little confusing, so pay close attention. When a new file is loaded, the Goomba spawns in one of four corners of the gray square on the right side of the map. Each time the player either dies or completes a level, the Goomba moves clockwise around the square. However, whenever the player moves onto one of the square's corners, which will be labeled as 1, 2, 3, and 4, from left to right like so, the Goomba will always move randomly. We know that in longer categories like Any% percent, No World 5 and Cannonless, the optimal starting position is position 1, as it guarantees the player will be able to successfully avoid a Goomba fight. The answer for Any% percent is a little more complicated though. While the Goomba moves consistently around the square, Moves in different directions take different amounts of time. For example, when the Goomba moves down, it takes 0 frames for the Goomba to start moving down. When moving left and right, it takes the Goomba 21 frames total for the Goomba to turn 90 degrees and then turn back 90 degrees after running. When the Goomba moves up, it takes 35 total frames for the Goomba to turn 180 degrees and then turn back 180 degrees after running. This means downward movements are the fastest direction by far. This is because the Goomba is always facing down when stationary. Whenever the Goomba goes in any direction other than down, it takes time for him to turn and turn back. The any% percent route leaves World 1 via the cannon, and only completes 3 levels. This means the Goomba moves in 3 of the 4 directions. Here is a visual showing the number of total frames it takes the Goomba to move starting at each position. This shows that position 1 is the optimal position for the Goomba to start at, as it loses the least time. Position 2 and position 3 are equal because they lose the same amount of time, and position 4 is the worst, as it loses the most time. So, if we take a look back at this run by Fade, we can notice that Fade is 0.6 behind out of 1 cannon. This is a result of Goomba RNG, not doing the cannon level wrong. This 0.6 second time loss shows us that the Goomba must have loaded in position 4 when he loaded the new save file. How do we know? His 2429 got perfect RNG as he lost no time going out of one cannon, so we know that Fade lost 0.6 seconds comparatively to his last run. If we look back at position 4's total time loss overall, it's 1.28 seconds. If we subtract that by position 1's total overall time loss, 0.7 seconds, we get about 0.6 seconds, the amount of time that Fade lost to his last run. This proves that Fade got the worst RNG possible. While this does affect longer categories in a similar way, any percent is the only category optimized enough that Goomba movement matters. As of the time of this upload, there is no way to manipulate the Goomba spawns, so there's always some chance that a run will lose 0.5 seconds in World 1. And that's all the information you will ever want to know about a Goomba. Total credit goes to Gigsa1 for testing this and providing me with all the information. A paste bin with more information and his Twitch will be in the description. After this run, Fade would have to take a break with exams coming up. During this break, two strats were discovered in World 8 that would save about a second total, but a very valuable second nonetheless. The first strat is known as Crouch Jumping, which is most valuable in 8-2. In this level's secret exit, there are fast rolling hills that roll against the direction of Mario's movement, which significantly reduces his speed, even while jumping over them. A runner that goes by the name of Astix found a strat to increase her speed while jumping over these rolling platforms, and any other platforms that roll opposite to Mario's movement. It was already known that crouching, jumping, and then releasing the crouch at the apex of your jump would reset your running speed back to normal. Astix used this knowledge to speed up the secret exit area of 8-2 by about half a second. Here is a comparison showing the difference between the two strategies. The second strat, also found by Astix, is called Shell Boost. 
This strategy involves using the shell of a buzzy beetle to cancel Mario's spin that is necessary to get over this lava geyser. The reason you'd want to do that is because Mario's falling speed after propellering is significantly slower than Mario's normal falling speed. Throwing the shell cancels Mario's propeller and saves about half a second. And so, after exams were over, Fade would return to the game one final time to do one thing. Claim the category as his once and for all. On January 9th, 2020, Fade would beat his world record once again and finish the run with a time of 24-28. BOOM! GAS! <sighs> Broke the tie. Let's fucking go. This run was the culmination of all previous strategies discussed in the video combined into one. The main time losses around the run were 8-2 due to slappy crouch jumps and 8 castle because of bad fireball RNG. So while this run is insane, it is still improvable. And that's where the world record stands as of this video's upload date, 2428. Over the period of 11 years, the game's world record went from 45 minutes down to 24 minutes, all as a result of the efforts made by many people that have come and gone over the past decade. In this time, only four players held the world record, from the SDA era of Raker Z, to the defeat of Raker Z by Green Uprooter, to the long reign of Oshgard, and finally, to the current domination of Fade Vanity. All of these runners combined and the community collectively pushed the game to a level that no one could have possibly predicted all those years back on that SDA thread. At the time of this video's creation, it's only been a few months since Fade's world record. Where does the game stand today? Well, currently, Fade is not actively speedrunning the game, but a few players have gotten close to beating the world record. One notable runner is Uvideo, who came very close to beating Fade's record with the new game leaderboards on speedrun.com. The game leaderboards are now ranked by the final time without loads. Previously, many runners would be multiple seconds behind others, but not as a result of less skill, rather worse loads. Here's a comparison of runner DCA's loads, currently the best in the community, compared to runner Pidgey's loads, probably some of the worst in the community. This gap isn't large, but over a 24 minute speedrun, these add up. So much so, that at least 2 minutes are cut off of the run. So, for example, DCA's old PB with loads is 24.45. Without loads, it's 22.42. Excluding the 2 minutes, that's a 3 second difference. Pidgey's PB with loads is 24.40, only 5 seconds faster than DCA's. However, without loads, that time is 22.28, which means in reality, Pidgey's run is actually 14 seconds faster than DCA's, not 5 seconds faster. This also means that some placements in the leaderboard occurred after this change. As a hypothetical, someone could have had a 24.50 with loads that went down to a 22.46 without loads. A person slightly behind him could have had a 24.52 with loads, but without loads, that could have been a 22.42, meaning that their run was actually faster, changing their place on the leaderboard. While it may be slightly confusing, it's a much better way of judging if runs are actually faster or slower, not just if the person has a better disk drive in their Wii. How does this relate back to you video? Well, his original run with loads was a 24.35, which is 7 seconds off of Fade's 24.28 with loads. However, Uvid has less than average loads, and Fade has above average loads, so it was extremely possible that Uvid's time without loads was actually faster than Fade's. However, this was not the case, as Fade's world record without loads is 22.21, and Uvid's run ended up being 22.24, so while he did not get a world record with this run, he was extremely close. And that's where the game stands today as a whole. The community has grown so much over the past few years, and it's made its way to being the top 40 most active game on speedrun.com consistently. The community is still working hard to push this game past its limits in any percent and in all other categories. I personally believe people will push this record farther than we know it to be possible. Maybe another huge discovery like Bombless or 556 will come up. While it may be unlikely, it's certainly not impossible. But who knows what's possible or not? Who knows where the game will be pushed in the next decade? Well, the answer is nobody knows. Nobody truly has the answer to this question. Only time will tell.